Imagine getting caught up in a murder case simply because you were at the wrong place at the wrong time, being interrogated as if you're the killer, and going through a guilty trial that resulted in a death sentence. Unfortunately, there are cases where strong individuals were wrongfully executed, and here are their stories. Cameron Todd Willingham in the year of 1991, a fire occurred in Cameron's home in Texas that resulted in the death of his three young daughters. Cameron escaped with injuries and luckily his wife was not home at the time. Prosecutors of the case charged Cameron with starting the fire purposely with the motive of him trying to cover up abuse within the household, even though his wife testified that he had never abused his children and I quote, she said, spoiled them rotten. During his case, lab tests verified that an accelerant was only used near the front porch children's room and the hallway to start the fire. However, Gerald Hurst, a doctor in chemistry, said that extreme heat of fire did not in turn mean that an accelerant was used. However, the Board of Pardons and Paroles still did not show any leniency. In the case, Cameron was even deemed as a sociopath by a psychiatrist, but only utilizing his Iron Maiden and Led Zeppelin posters as indicators of his violence. Additionally, the witnesses that was brought on by the prosecutors were often contradictory and was even considered inconclusive. He was offered multiple life sentences in an exchange for a guilty plea, but during his time on death row, he had always insisted his innocence. He was executed by lethal injection on February 17, 2004, and in June of 2009, the state of Texas ordered a re-examination of the case, and the Texas Forensic Science Commission found that the evidence in the case were mishandled and misinterpreted. They concluded that none of the evidence used against Cameron was valid. It turned out that the fire was in fact accidental. Ellis Wayne Felker in 1981, Ellis was a suspect in the disappearance of a Georgia college student named Evelyn Joy Ludlam, who was working her way through school as a cocktail waitress. Ellis was put under surveillance for about two weeks, which is the same time frame when Evelyn's body was finally found in a nearby creek, raped, stabbed, and murdered. The autopsy that was performed primarily determined that the body had been dead for five days, but the information was later changed after they realized that the information would eliminate Ellis as a suspect due to the surveillance they had done. However, the medical examiner testified at trial to change the findings to fit Ellis as a suspect because of the air temperature, state of decomposition, and the fact that Evelyn was wearing the same clothes as she was last seen in, leading him to conclude that she had died two weeks before her body was found. The problem is the fact that they are only using circumstantial evidence and not the actual evidence itself. In 1996, Felker's attorneys found boxes of evidence that had been withheld by the prosecutors that included DNA evidence as well as a written confession by another suspect. In fact, even the judge in one of Felker's trials said that the fair trial had already been severely compromised. Despite the large evidence of his innocence, the Georgia Supreme Court still denied Ellis a new trial or the right to look through the new evidence to argue an exoneration. Ellis Wayne Felker was executed by electrocution on the 15th of November in 1996. Multiple independent assessments of the autopsy evidence had been been ordered and all results pointed to the fact that Evelyn had died three days before the body was found, therefore would have eliminated Ellis as a suspect completely. Brian Terrell on the 9th of December 2015, just before 1 a.m., Georgia executed Brian Terrell by lethal injection. As the nurse administered the drug, Brian mouthed out the words, I didn't do it. In his trial, the defense argued that there was no physical evidence that could link Brian to the murder and that the death sentence as well as the conviction were a product of misconduct by the prosecutors allowing false and misleading testimonies. In fact, the physical evidence all points to Brian's innocence. For example, the footprints that were found near the victim's body were much smaller than Brian's feet, and the corresponding 13 fingerprints that were found did not match his. Georgia even tried Brian three times. The first trial resulted in mistrial because the jurors couldn't agree, and the second resulted in his conviction but later was overturned by the Supreme Court. The third trial resulted with a conviction and death sentence after Brian's cousin, Jermaine Johnson, testified as a witness to the murder. However, he later admitted to lying due to the pressure to save himself. In fact, 
Jermaine was already spending time in jail, facing the possible threat of a death penalty, before making a deal with the prosecutors to testify against him in exchange for a much smaller five-year sentence. Brian's lawyers argued that the prosecutors presented misleading testimonies that suggested that a neighbor had seen Brian at the murder scene. But when she was asked outside of the court, she mentioned that she actually told authorities that Brian Terrell was absolutely not the man she had seen. Larry Griffin On the 26th of June, 1980, a 19-year-old named Quentin Moss was killed when a drive-by shooting occurred in St. Louis, Missouri. Apparently, it happened while a drug deal was happening on a street corner. The conviction was largely based on a testimony by a man named Robert Fitzgerald, who was a known career criminal who was also at the scene during the murder. He testified that there were three black men in the car when the shots were fired, and emphasized that Larry Griffin was the one who shot Quentin through a window with his right hand. Unfortunately, this was Larry's defense attorney's first murder trial. Therefore, he did not challenge the testimony that was given, even though it was widely known that Larry was left-handed. The attorney also failed to bring up a witness that would have provided an alibi for Larry, because the witness was with him at the time of the murder. Additionally, Larry's fingerprints wasn't found in the car nor on the weapon, and all the evidence used against him was simply circumstantial. The prosecution also failed to address the fact that there were two other witnesses who confirmed that Larry had no involvement in the murder and in fact were able to name the three men who actually did. Even with the amount of evidence that clearly pointed towards his innocence, the appeals courts upheld the conviction as well as the death sentence. Larry maintained his innocence to the point of execution by lethal injection on the 21st of June, 1995. Ten years later, in 2005, a professor of the University of Michigan Law School reopened the case and the investigation concluded that Larry was in fact innocent. Richard Masterson on the 20th of January, 2016, Texas executed Richard Masterson by lethal injection, but in the midst of his death sentence are the questions and doubts that surrounds it. Richard even sought out a stay of execution, or in other words, a delay in carrying out the execution date. Based on what his lawyers found was heavy evidence of state fraud, misconduct, and evidence of his innocence, the filing challenged the testimony of the forensic team presented by the prosecution in this case. The medical examiner, Paul Schroeder, was told by prosecutors prior to the autopsy that Richard had confessed to putting a sleeper hold on the victim during a sexual encounter using asphyxiation. Therefore, the examiner ruled Darren Honeycutt's death a homicide and testified that he had died due to strangulation. However, Richard's lawyers found that the prosecutors had withheld evidence that Paul Schrode, the medical examiner, was unqualified to perform the autopsy and therefore botched the results. He falsified his credentials and therefore a false testimony in this case, as well as multiple other capital murder trials. Two pathologists examined the autopsy data and proved that Paul Schrode was completely unqualified and incorrectly ruled the death as a homicide when both pathologists found that it was likely caused by a heart attack. Paul Schrode was fired as the chief medical examiner in El Paso County, Texas, after it was confirmed that he had falsified information in his resume. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. Please let me know what other topics you'd like for me to do a video on. See you next time and don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe.